Hello, I'm going to be talking about reliability in R and how to estimate it using R. So I'll go over what reliability is, the different types of reliability. I'll briefly describe the concepts and I will go over some of the R code and some output produced. Uh, now, this is just meant to be just a general broad overview and I'll cover uh, pretty much a lot of topics. So what is reliability? It's easy to think of it as something distinct from validity. So one popular, very popular example is the example with the scale, a, weight, a weighted scale to, to measure your weight. Um, I can get on the scale and let's say it's giving me a different number every time I get on the scale in that I'm getting, I, I look at the scale, it gives me a number, I get off the scale and then I just immediately just get back on the scale. It's giving me a different number each time. In this example here, you can say the, the scale to measure my weight is not very reliable. However, let's say I get on the scale and it's giving me the same number each time. It's saying 616161. Now, it's, it's reliable, however, it's not very valid because it's, I, I'm interested in measuring my weight and it's giving me my height. So it's uh, missing, missing the mark uh, in that sense. Now, it, even though it's important, to, it's, it's important to distinguish the conceptually the difference between reliability and validity, you can't have a valid measure or instrument without it being reliable and um, you need reliability in order to have validity. So it's, it's important to think of them as these two different concepts, but you still need reliability first and foremost. Now, there are different types of reliability. There's test retest, parallel form, iterator, and internal consistency. And I will go over ways to estimate the each one of these and specific examples. And I'll briefly describe each one. So the data set that I'll be using for many of my examples will be the data set from the Kern Smooth IRT package. You can install it with install.packages. Um, and right now I'm just going to call it. And the data set I'll use is the Bex Depression Inventory. Let me run it. And it will pull up a data set. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to just convert it to a data frame because it's just going to be easier for me to work with with this data dot frame function. And within the function, what I want to do with these responses to the uh, BDI uh, Bex depression inventory is I'm just going to uh, omit um, any uh, missing responses of uh, I'll basically eliminate that participant completely and, and this is actually the name of the data set uh, I didn't need to include this there um, it's BDI responses and I will name it BDI okay so so the data set includes 239 observations and 21 variables the scale is either it's an ordinal scale from zero to three and it's trying to measure uh, depression. So to estimate test retest and, and parallel form, these two types of reliability or reliability coefficients, you can just use the correlation um, function to estimate them with COR. And so let, let me briefly go over what test retest reliability is. So let's say you have a test, you administer the test, and now you want to administer the same exact test again to the same same sample. Those The correlation of those two tests will be your reliability coefficient, and the higher the coefficient, the more reliable it is. Now, parallel form is a little different in that instead of allowing the participant to, to retake the same exact test, you're giving them a different version of the test, which is almost exactly the same. So let's say you in your first test, you, you're measuring, let's just say, anxiety um, and how stressful is it to get acclimated to a new phone. A, a parallel form for that item could be 
how uh, stressful is it uh, to work with a new computer? So it's uh, these should be very parallel to the uh, original um, original test, right? So so there there are two ways, and there there are weaknesses with both. Um, let's say with test retest, you're giving them the same exact test. However, students uh, or participants who retake the same test, the issue is that they'll just remember what they uh, what they they'll have a memory of the test. So you have to administer it um, not too soon. At the same time, not you can't wait too long either because uh, over time, people will just gain knowledge. So it's so you have to administer that. There's a somewhat of a balance. They have to sort of somewhat forget it, yet not you can't wait too long so that they accrue new knowledge. Um, where parallel form uh, is, you know, allows you to administer it right after or same exact time. However, the issue is that you never truly know whether something is, whether this different test is still exactly the same. So there, there are weaknesses with both. Usually with test retest from my memory, uh, they usually recommend waiting about one to three months or so um, before the next administration. Um, uh, before administering the test again, my bad. Uh, so, but to either way, the function you'd use to get this uh, reliability coefficient is is just the correlation between both tests. And let's in this in this example right here, BDI the data set. I'm just assuming here. I'm just using this as an example. Um, BDI two. I like I, I don't have a BDI two data set, but. This is uh, what it would be. I would be uh, using the row sums function to get the total test score for each participant and seeing if they correlate uh, for each participant. So this could either be used for test retest or parallel form. Um, the, the goal is, again, is just to get in at the correlation. Now, in addition to that, the, the next type of reliability is inter-rater reliability. And this is when you have... Uh, for an instrument, instead of participants putting down their answers in some way, where you're getting is more the some rater is scoring the participant in some way instead. Um, so the uh, so it's a different type of test. In this case, now you're most interested in is whether and a good practice is to have multiple raters review it, uh, at least two and. You, you want to know whether these raters agree um, that they're observing the same thing from these participants. And to get this is the basically the inter-rater reliability. And the simplest way to uh, simplest way to look at it, one way to do it is to just count the number of times both raters agree and divide it by the total uh, total number of items. However, a more precise estimation accounts for agreement due to chance, because you can have some agreement um, uh, that, that is just due to chance alone. And one way to estimate this is with Cohen's Kappa. Um, this function is available in the lab on the site package. So let me just call it. I've already installed it um, and I'm just calling it right now. So in this example, we're just, let's just say column one and column three are, represent scores from different raters. So this is just, I'm just using the data set as an example. Um, and with this table function right here, and I'm just gonna call it test one. I'm just gonna get the table between columns one and three. And even though it's not, based on a rater is based on participant score. This is just an example. Uh, I just want to look at the table. So the diagonal represents the agreement. Um, zero, one, and two represents the values uh, for the for the item. And, and this is like the frequency number of participants that fall in. So what Cohen, uh, so let's, we can run Cohen's kappa on this test using cohen.kappa function and I'm setting the number of observations to 239 which is the number in the sample and let's run this so 
what it'll provide here is the unweighted weighted kappa and the estimates are right in the middle. Um, these are just the bounds, the lower and upper bounds. So the, the higher, the better. This, since this was a, uh, just an example, um, it's not, so the closer to one, the better, but this, in this example, I didn't really didn't expect much. So it's, this is not even, the data are not even um, rate or so. It's, it's, the example purpose was just to show you how to run the function. Now, now with the difference between a weighted kappa, a weighted kappa considers, uh, pulls in data from the off diagonal elements as well. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, and, and that, that's pretty much it. And you can report uh, the one you're most interested in, um, in that case. Now, now moving on to internal consistency reliability metrics, Cronbox Alpha is one of the most popular types of internal consistency measurements. Um, now, you, you might be thinking, so with test, retest, and parallel form, you know, what if we just have this one test, we just split it in half, which is a split half reliability. Uh, what the Cronbox Alpha, one reason why it's so popular is that it looks at all possible split half reliabilities, uh, these correlations between these halves. Um, uh, and, and it's more preferred in split half reliability because, you know, how do you determine the best split and what um, Cronbach alpha does is just aggregates all all the possible splits now let's run it it's also under the library site package as well and let's see what it let's look at the output that is produced so you get a lot of output here um, let's scroll to the top okay so the alpha coefficient that you're most interested in, let me, okay, so the alpha coefficient you're most interested in is this raw alpha score right here, which is pretty good in this, in, for this scale, for the BDI, it appears to be 0.8. Generally, the rule of thumb is, you, you generally just want it as, as high as possible, but the cutoff that I've seen is 0.7. Um, now, the, you also get a bunch of other reliability coefficients. Uh, the alpha, Cronbox alpha in itself is also uh, equivalent to Gutman's lambda. Uh, the Gutman's lambda six right over here, it's, it's another type of internal consistency metric. Uh, it employs squared multiple correlations and it, it can differ from alpha when there's some degree of multidimensionality in the test. Now, okay, so yeah, the also the standardized alpha uh, is based on correlations rather than covariances. Um, they, they should all be close. Uh, so this right over here is the average R. Uh, this is like the, the mean of the inter-item correlations. Uh, this right over here, this right over here, it, it gets a little bit too close. This is the signal to noise ratio, which is a way of measuring the another it's in quality of test uh, index and it incorporates the correlate the average correlation between each pair of items and the number of items in the test. Now, this right over here is the average standard error, um, which can uh, for, that can be used with the alpha and uh, to calculate confidence intervals. And right here is the mean and standard deviation of, uh, this is of all the items, um, the, the scores uh, that were given to each item. And this is the median correlation between among all the different pairs of correlation pairs of item correlation um this is the median right here now the same statistics are also calculated for each item as well Get, uh, i'm sorry it's calculated for the test if each item is dropped so right here you can actually look at 
whether what will happen if uh, item is removed if it's lowered that means that you know the item should stay uh, if you're interested in let's just say uh, identifying uh, an item that can impact reliability however if it's increased then you know that's something you should at least look at uh, to, to evaluate the item in this example here you can see the there's an actual increase from what we had before which is 0 0.8 uh, a 0.8 alpha so dropping item 19 would actually increase it so it's a might you know be worth looking into also providing the output are some additional item statistics for each item Generally, this right over here, the this is the number in the sample. Uh, right over here is raw dot r. This is the correlation of items with the total score, or in other words, the item total correlation when the item is included. Um, also, this uh, next to it, right over here, std dot r. This is the uh, this is when same thing with the raw dot r, but this is what happens when the uh, items are standardized. Now with the R dot core right over here, this is the correlation corrected uh, for any item overlap that happens uh, with the item to uh, item to total test correlation. Right over here is the R dot drop. Uh, this is the correlation of the item with the with the entire instrument or test when the when that item is excluded from the overall test and this is right over here is mean and sd this is the average and standard deviation of the uh, values given to the item so you can see uh, a, a specific range and this is some additional statistics uh, frequencies uh, for the actual values themselves before instead of just the mean and standard deviation the actual values range from zero to three, and you can see the frequency of selecting a specific response. So it's, so, you know, it's, it might be decent to, uh, might, it might be worth looking at as well. And all this outputs provided. Now with alpha, alpha is a generalization of an uh, earlier estimate of ability, which is the Cooter Richardson. Um, also known as KR20. Um, there's also KR21, which is a shortcut approximation of the KR20. Uh, it's a generalization when you have some sort of, when, when it's non-binary, when it's not just zeros and ones, and you're actually incorporating some ordinal polytomous scale as well. So the so if you're um, looking for Cooter's Richardson, it's the same value of, of alpha. Now, in addition to that, you should, with the alpha function also provides is a way to, um, because you might have items that are reverse coded, let's say you're measuring, especially when you're measuring a construct or something, you might have asked in certain questions where, let's say, each uh, high value in each item indicates more of the construct, but you, you, might, you may have switched it up in some ways with some items where a high value actually indicates less of that construct you're trying to measure. And in this case, you can use the keys equal, uh, keys um, function with, within the alpha function, uh, and you just indicate a negative. In this example right here, this is just a what if, if uh, let's just say my second item in the entire scale was uh, reverse coded, then I can, indicate a negative one for that and then I can run and, and it's important to do that because you can actually you might um, end up with a negative value of alpha which you know which is not desired um, but one reason one potential reason let's say you get a negative alpha it could one thing you could immediately check is whether one of your items needs to be reverse coded now there are the limitations of alpha now, even though it's a very popular um, uh, measure uh, estimate of internal consistency reliability, the um, model itself is a essentially what is called essentially tau equivalent model uh, for internal consistency measurement. Um, it, a lot of times, it's uh, to in the literature, it's often good to compare it to two other types of models. 
parallel model essential there's the essential tau equivalent model uh, which is the alpha space on and con generic model so I'll, I'll go over these three so with the parallel model the true score variance uh, the item true score variance the item true score means and error variance are, are all constant uh, with the essentially tau equivalent model the item true score variance are constant but the item true score means and error variances can vary. And the congeneric model, the item true score variances, the item true score means and the error variances can all vary. Now, as you can see, uh, um, the uh, compared to essentially tau equivalent model, congeneric model is much less restrictive, but uh, the, the parallel model is much more restrictive. Now, this is all based on the classical test theory framework. So in classical test, uh, classical test theory, um, your some scale, your total score on some scale is based on your true score plus some measurement error. True score and error are always unknown and can uh, but can be estimated, but you'll basically ha have to estimate them in some way. Now, the how this ties into the reliability coefficient discuss reliability coefficient can be used to estimate true and error variance. So you can uh, um, use that to estimate it. Now, the assumptions required for alpha that all items in the scale have equal sensitivity is likely untenable in practice. Additionally, most scales have some degree of multidimensionality, uh, which further violate you know, unidimensionality assumption required for alpha. Violations of the assumptions cause alpha to underestimate internal consistency when errors for items are correlated, but they can also overestimate internal consistency when uh, errors for items are very correlated and, and or scale length is increased. So and so what what's a good alternative to alpha you might be asking? Uh, one of that one of them is uh, McDonald's uh, Omega. Now what is uh, McDonald's Omega? But first uh, let's let me come back to that. Though some degree degree of multidimensionality uh, may be expected. Unidimensionality is an assumption for both alpha and omega. It is advised that scales designed to measure multiple factors uh, so should be subdivided into subscales and alpha or omega should be calculated for each subscale. Uh, now, however, the, it's important to note it can, um, omega can still be used for multidimensional scales. Uh, the, the key point here for unidimensionality, from my understanding, is that the each the entire scale should be under some, uh, there should be one overall latent variable or uh, some latent attribute that it, the scale is measuring. So even though there might be these sub factors, uh, overall that all items should be loaded on some general factor in order for you to use omega and and in order for it to be one type of scale in a way and so however though you you can um you know in the past it has been used where you can subdivide your scale and calculate uh, an alpha for each there um you, you can also instead just use the Omega, but this is uh, another way of saying the unidimensionality assumption. Uh, that that's what's needed for either alpha or omega to be used. Now, uh, with, with all the assumptions uh, of alpha, when uh, when all the assumptions of alpha are met, alpha and omega are equivalent. It's suggested that omega should be used when you uh, multidimensionality is present. So uh, omega is actually much more preferred uh, in in those cases. And many, actually, many researchers actually encourage the use of uh, omega more off more often than it already is being used in the literature. And this is uh, originally what I said: there should be some 
overall general fact for it, it to even be defined as a scale. Uh, so, so that's first thing uh, that would be required. Uh, and, and the reason why is because uh, there's not ever going to be a perfectly unidimensional scale. There's always going to be some degree of multidimensionality uh, to be expected. Now, the uh, omega function in the psych package, it employs an exploratory factor analysis and provides reliability estimates based on general and total factor saturation. So with, within, the same, within the same library psych package, the function, I don't know why I had that, but the function right over here, omega, uh, and it's same thing, omega, similar to alpha, I just need the name of the data set that I'll be using. So let's run it. And you get a lot of output. And let's scroll up to the top so we can review. And I'll, okay, so here we go. Okay, so let's scroll down. Now, okay, so, so the first thing, the first two things is uh, the same as before, you all, they also provide alpha and uh, Gutman's lambda, same with the uh, same with the alpha function. Uh, in addition, however, you, you now you, but now you also get the uh, omega coefficients as well, and you get three of them. Okay, so they're ty the types of omega. So the first one right over here is omega hierarchical. Now, omega hierarchical estimates the precision of a scale in measuring one general overall construct. Uh, in other words, what degree does a single construct explain the test score variance based on some square loadings onto this general factor? Now, what the omega total does, it estimates the position of a subscale. Well, this one right over here, I'm jumping around from, I went from here to here right now, omega total. And what this omega total estimates is the precision of a scale in measuring multiple subscales as a uh, multidimensional scale based on some of square loadings of all factors. So this is the total plus the sub factors that are also being uh, the, the the general factor plus the sub factors. And it's in in the function, it's already set to three lower order or sub factors, you can call them. You can also change it to adjust it uh, to uh, just add a comma and factor and the, the number of factors you're interested in for your particular scale. Now, the uh, this one right over here is the uh, omega h asymptotic. Uh, it is the it's basically the omega hierarchical calculated for an infinite long test while maintaining the structure of the scale. So so main but mainly generally speaking, these are the two omega values you'd be most interested in uh, looking at. Uh, more so, the in, in this case, more so the, the omega total, uh, and also referred to as the omega t. Now, the the difference between the omega total, uh, mainly omega total gives in gives a reliability estimate of overall variance in the data that is due to a general factor and lower level factors. Uh, the omega h is a reliability estimate for the variance that is due to just the general factor only. So, one uh, did I miss a okay? So, okay. So, but uh, so what? How was I, I think I went over. I, I skipped over this. Uh, I don't know what this is here, but uh, so how is this uh, omega function calculated? It's calculated by performing a factor analysis. The lower level factors are rotated obliquely. Then, from the correlation matrix produced, one general factor is calculated, and the Schmidt and Lyman transformation. Hopefully. I'm pronouncing that correctly. I'm bad with pronunciations. Uh, hopefully the Schmidt and Lyman transformation is used to find the item loadings onto the general factor. The, yeah, I should be better at pronunciations given I have like a really tough last name to pronounce, but uh, I don't, it doesn't really translate. But uh, yeah, so th these are the uh, this table right here will show the actual factor 
loadings um, uh, for each item onto the factors. Uh, and on the right hand side, you actually get the uh, graph. Um, this is a visualization of what's on the left hand side. You, G representing the general factor loading on almost all the factors it should be. And uh, the and the three sub or lower factors and the loadings are indicated as well so and you can see them here on the left hand side uh, the actual loadings for each so so yeah so let me so the, these are all the the loadings onto each factor and the h2 is the amount of variance from the item explained by the factors. And uh, this U2 is, is just one minus the H2 or the residual amount of variance. This P2 right here is the percent of common variance for an item that is, that is general factor variance. So, so it gives you all this information here in this table. And it also provides the eigenvalues uh, that that um, are, are also here as well. Uh, generally speaking, what you, you want to look at, uh, generally when it comes to eigenvalues, uh, the, there's this sort of cutoff of uh, eigenvalue is equal to one. Uh, I, I, and what is an eigenvalue? It, it provides the amount of variance among the items explained by the factors. And, and typically, uh, like if you're using some screen plot, it'll give you like this sort of cutoff of one, uh, which you're looking for eigenvalues greater or equal to one in, in many cases. And this subset of output right over here, it, it just gives you general statistics on these eigenvalues that that you, you might be interested you, you might be interested in reporting now the explained common variance of the general factor here it shows it's 0.43 this is the it's basically the eigenvalue right here divide of the general factor divided by the uh, sum of all the other eigenvalues. And it's somewhat of a, indi another indication um, of unidimensionality. The higher that this ratio is, uh, the more variance attributed that, that would be attributed to the general factor. So uh, higher values indicate more unidimensionality. Um, so yeah. So yeah, that's for that. And so this next subset right over here of output, this right over here, it shows the fit indices of the comparison of the hypothesis of whether the three factor model is sufficient. And a significant value indicates a rejection of this hypothesis. And this would suggest that that maybe in this for this scale I can actually include additional factors as well. So maybe three sub factors is, is is not sufficient. So I could reject this hypothesis given that it's significant. And this subset right over here are the fit indices um, testing uh, measuring uh, the model uh, same as before, but this time it's the whether the one factor model or general factor is sufficient and uh, significance indicates that we can reject this hypothesis and that the and and in that you know more more factors are uh, are would be needed or, or could be used or suggested that uh, more, more factors could be used the, and those are all the fit indices for it. Um, and this subset right over here, it, it provides you the just correlations of the fact, uh, the, the correlations of scores with the factors um, and different statistics for, for each one. Um, and now this right over here, this final subset, it shows the omega values for um, and, and each column represents uh, the first uh, G is representing overall. Um, 
each one represents uh, the items assigned each items assigned to one specific group and it's going to calculate in each row the omega uh, for each one the, the first one is the omega total which is the o, o, including the general factor with sub factors what what these values are the second one is just the omega general factor for for each for for the overall and sub subscales as well and the next one is just the omega group which is the the uh, lower level factors or grouping factors um, for the omega value uh, for, for the overall and, and, and subscales as well and it, it, it's, it, it, it's like additional it's just additional information that, that you can pretty much use but overall you, you might uh, uh, it, it's good to inspect this but it's incurred uh, it's uh, suggested that you have some idea of the factor structure first uh, before jumping into the test this was just I, I was the goal was just to run through the Omega analysis um, however you should have some idea of the different factors associated with with the uh, specific test that you're measuring beforehand before jumping and doing in uh, Omega uh, however, generally speaking, uh, you'd be most you should always look at the, the information as well. But uh, for the most part, uh, in this this example, often used is are reported as this one and and or this omega total right over here, uh, either omega hierarchical or or omega total. And yeah, so I went through yeah they explain common variance that is the ratio. Uh, and the omega subsets as well. Yeah, and this that's pretty much it. And um, the only important thing to always note is that different types of reliability measure different facets of reliability. So, so you even though alpha is very popular, it's very encouraged. There's been a growing uh, number of researchers suggesting that omega should also be used. In fact, more so because the the conditions or uh, assumptions required for alpha are not very common or, or should not be often expected. That's why omega should be used more often. Um, but in addition to that, you know, there might be times when you should be using other types of reliability, like if it's based on rater scores, you, you might should be more should be measuring inter-rater reliability or depending on the experimental design, maybe um, in some cases, it might be better for a test free test if you've already conducted that experiment. Um, so yeah, so so just to note that, um, let me know if you have any questions uh, in the comments. I will try to answer as many as I can. Um, let me know if you like the video and thank you.